Hello YouTube, this is Matt Pullen. The game we are going to look at today was played in the 1995 U.S. Open between Richard Kapke and James Franklin Wheat. This game opened e4, g6, d4, bishop, g7, knight, c3, and uh, Black chose a uh, very uh, combative version of the modern defense, 3c5, introducing tension in the center right away. Other moves are like c6, uh, d6, maybe sometimes a6 for uh, black. But c5 is uh, c5 is an important variation. If you uh, you know, play white, you know you should have something in mind against this uh, development scheme from black. Uh, g6, bishop, g7, c5. Uh, the uh, the most critical move probably for white in this position is the move played in the game. D takes C5. Let's look at you know, some other paths real quickly. After knight f3, black uh, can play C takes D4, and knight takes D4, and D6. This is a relative of the Sicilian dragon. It will probably transpose once black uh, plays knight f6. In addition, black doesn't have to take the pawn right away on uh, D4. He can play queen a5. This variation aims to set up uh, you know, pressure immediately on the long diagonal before committing any of Black's other pieces. It's a variation called the uh, Pterodactyl by uh, Eric Schiller or the uh, Sniper variation by uh, Charlie Story. And uh, I will not be discussing the, uh, the theory of this variation due to time constraints. But I'll just do a quick mention of what Schiller refers to as the unpin variation, bishop d2, with the idea being after uh, c takes d4, knight d5, attacking the black queen, and also the c7 square, which forces queen d8. So it's just keep that variation in the back of your mind while we're going over uh, this game. So after 3c5, uh, there's a uh, more d5, then black plays d6, and this is a Schmid Benoni, which is a different opening altogether. So, uh, yeah, let's look at uh, d takes c5. And here, uh, white just uh, you know, forces black to lose time in recapturing the pawn on c5. It uh, tends to lead to Sicilian structures, where white is the open d file, black has the open c file. So white is going to emphasize his uh, speed of development. So there are, uh, there are several moves that get played here. Uh, bishop takes c3, sacrificing the potentially strong Fianchetta bishop, but giving white triple pawns. This is a line that gets played. After queen a5, threatening to uh, recover one of the c pawns, white has queen d4 forcing black to defend the uh, rook on h8. So say knight f6, and then queen b4. This uh, you know, guards the pawns and also threatens black's queen. And after queen takes b4, c takes b4, white's pawns are untripled. And after uh, knight takes e4, bishop b2, this position is likely to favor white. Uh, it makes more sense just to retreat queen c7 continues to pressure the c pawn and uh, you know maybe knight c6 or knight a6 will attack the uh, white queen on b4. So bishop d3 which covers the e4 pawn, knight c6, queen a4, a square relatively safe from attack. And then knight e5, knight e2 is uh, thought to be a slight advantage for white. Also instead of bishop takes c3 there is queen a5, which is kind of similar to the uh, pterodactyl from earlier, where uh, the knight is pinned, black is preparing to recoup the pawn on c5, and also there's some pressure on uh, c3. So bishop d2, and then uh, if queen takes c5, because white was threatening to play knight to b5, which uh, would have the idea of bringing the bishop to c3, challenging black's bishop, and also uh, threatening the c7 square. 
So, queen takes c5, and now knight d5. So here, uh, white is threatening to kick the queen, and then play knight to c7 check. The queen is the only thing that defends c7 at the moment. For instance, if black plays knight f6, a logical looking move, which prepares to exchange for uh, white's most active piece, then there's bishop to b4, hitting the queen. The queen has to stay in touch with c7. So queen c6, and now bishop b5. And the queen can no longer stay in touch with uh, c7, because if the uh, queen takes on b5, then there's knight c7 check, and then takes black's queen. So after, uh, after queen c5, knight d5, knight a6, uh, pretty much forced, and then bishop e3, and here uh, this, this position favors white. If queen a5 check, then white can play c3, followed by bishop to d4, challenging black's strongest piece, and white has a nice space advantage here. Or, if instead queen c6 is uh, just knight f3, Black has you know, achieved a, uh, a dragon pawn structure, but the black pieces are rather strangely developed. So that, that didn't happen in this game. After d takes c5, I was just showing you some of the main choices. Um, knight c6 actually was played by black, just developing you know, without threatening to recapture in any way on uh, c5. So bishop to e3, just protecting c5, just in case, and developing a piece. Knight f6, possibly uh, in some lines, you know, preparing, threatening e4, maybe knight g4. You know, if, uh, say, white moves his queen. But white played f3. You know, guards the pawn, stops knight g4. But potentially, you know, if this bishop goes away, white's dark squares in the center are going to be very weak. So queen a5 was played by black, and now instead of blocking the pin with the bishop, white's able to block with the queen. So this is guarded, this is guarded, and the knight on c3 is not really pinned. So uh, the pawn, the black pawn that went to c5 in this game, uh, is like uh, is like Ethan Hunt, you know, a Mission Impossible. There was never any plan for black to uh, recover the pawn on c5. Instead, black is going to play b6 or d6 and uh, force white to spend more time exchanging this pawn, and then black will use that time to uh, you know to get open lines for his pieces. So, so it's a sort of a, uh, an opening gambit that Black is playing. Uh, black castles, and then bishop c4, and rook d8. So it's rather obvious that uh, Black is playing to play d6, and open the, uh, the rook up on the same file as White's queen. So, oh, uh, you know, also notice that uh, these pieces, the bishop on c8 and rook on a8, are at the, at the moment, not playing any role in the game. So white uh, white castles, and if allowed, I'm sure he would like to continue his development with, say, uh, knight e2 and you know, king b1, knight c1, knight b3. Then he could count on a solid advantage because of his extra pawn on c5. But d6, you know, creating tension in the center, and hoping that uh, white exchanges the pawn and allows black's rook to become active. So instead, white plays knight d5. This is a very familiar looking move. White wants to exchange the queens and maintain his extra pawn on c5. For instance, after queen takes d2, rook takes d2, knight takes d5, bishop takes d5, d takes c5. This sets a little trap. White cannot capture the pawn on uh, c5 because Ouch, bishop h6. However, white can uh, keep the advantage if he plays uh, f4 instead, you know, threatening to capture the pawn on c5, and this is not easy for black to meet without concessions.
So uh, this did not happen. Instead, black captured the uh, knight on d5. And white took the queen on a5. Now, say black takes this queen right away. Um, bishop takes d5 now, and black has no way of recovering his pawn. However, black has some compensation for the pawn after, say, bishop e6. Because uh, this knight actually might be very well placed on uh, the queen side. The rook coming to c8. Uh, long diagonal pressure. So there might be some compensation here for, uh, for black. But instead, black decided to chop the bishop on e3. Well, what, what's the situation here? Um, black is threatening to take the queen on a5 still. He's threatening to take the rook, threatening to take the bishop. Black has already uh, gained two pieces for the queen. And uh, it's very important that one of the pieces is white's uh, dark square bishop. So most of white's pawns are on light squares, and his dark squares, especially in the center, are going to be very vulnerable, you know, since uh, black has a strong Fiancabot bishop on that color. So white played uh, queen a4, protecting the bishop and removing the queen from danger. And instead of taking the uh, rook on d1, black very smartly plays bishop takes b2 check. Now this bishop cannot be taken. King takes b2, knight takes d1 check, king c1, knight f2, trapping the rook. So bishop takes b2 is a very good move. If king b1, uh, this was an option for uh, you know, moving the king to the queen side as opposed to into the center. Here's how this might have played out. Knight takes uh, d1. This move threatens to trap the rook in the corner and also threatens to uh, fork white's king and queen. White has a move that stops both of these, however. Knight e2. So, uh, after knight c3 check, takes, bishop takes, bishop takes f7, is not really a sacrifice because uh, king takes and then you know, queen check, winning the bishop on c3, which is a very strong piece. After bishop e6, you know, queen takes, pawn takes. Uh, this is probably slightly better for black. Uh, it's an, another way this game could have played out. So, instead, white chose to bring the king into the center with king d2. Now here, uh, Houdini says that uh, black should have taken on uh, d1 right away. And here's, uh, here's what could have happened here. King takes d1, d takes c5, check, activating the rook on d8. King e1, bishop c3, check, king f2, rook d1. Uh, the pin on uh, white's back rank is... Uh, you know, it's potentially long-term, and it's so powerful that the computer feels white should sacrifice an exchange to be rid of it. So knight e2, you know, threatening the powerful bishop on c3, and also to capture uh, the rook. So rook takes, knight takes, or rook takes h2, chances are fairly equal. So it was better to take the rook right away. Instead, black decided to uh, give the check, d takes c5 check. And Houdini feels this is wrong because white could have taken the, uh, the knight, you know, king takes e3, and allowed rook takes d1. Well, I can't blame uh, black, I can't blame white for not wanting to go into this, but uh, you know, the computer has no fear. After c3, as uh, this move covers the d4 square, also threatens the rook, and in some situations, uh, queen b3 will threaten the bishop and also to take on f7. So rook b1 to prevent queen b3, and now uh, queen c2 would be a big mistake because of bishop to c1 check. The king cannot go to the uh, second rank because of rook b2. But after king d3, knight e5, the game is pretty much over.
So queen c2 is losing. King d2 actually, you know, preparing king to uh, c2. Looks, uh, looks counterintuitive, is actually the best move. After bishop to uh, d7, the position is quite complicated. Now uh, black might be threatening, something like knight e5. So queen c2 in this position, and then bishop c1. And again, uh, black can, white cannot afford to allow knight e5 uh, check, and he cannot afford to allow rook b2 penny. So there's king e1. And uh, here, the, uh, the rook is threatened, and black has to play rook to uh, a1. And it is, a, is an unclear position. It is uh, very unusual to see you know, the black uh, rook and bishop on a1 and c1. And there's very little that uh, white can do about it. But this, uh, this theme of uh, black playing on white's back rank crops up several times in this game. So after d takes c5, white should have taken, but instead played bishop d3. Here, black did take on d1, and now the constant threat of c4, and not in this position because there's queen takes c4, but c4 uh, exploiting the uh, bishop on d3 is a concern. So black, you know, played bishop to e6, which on the surface is a good move, Threatens, uh, threatens c4, threatens to, you know, bring the rook to c8, connects the rooks. You know, it gets fully developed. But there's actually a move which wins pretty much on the spot here because uh, of the white queen that has uh, very, very few squares on the queen side. And that is rook to d4. This move was missed by black in the game, but wins very quickly. Was was does uh, the queen do? So after queen b5, threatening the uh, pawn and also the bishop on b2. There's rook b4. Takes and bishop d4. So hitting the queen again. Queen g5, rook b1 check. King d2, bishop takes g1. And again, we have two black pieces on uh, cooperating on white's back rank. So bishop e6 was a blunder because it overlooked the winning rook d4. After this move, queen to b5, hitting the uh, bishop, the important thing had a bishop on uh, b2, and also the pawn, which black wants to advance to c4. Black should have uh, played bishop a3, which saves both pieces. And uh, you know, in the long term, you know, rook c8 and then trying to play c4. But instead, uh, black plays a mistake here and allows, he plays c4, winning this piece but allowing uh, white to capture the dark square bishop. The dark square bishop is obviously much more important than uh, white's doomed white square bishop, so c4 is, uh, is an error of judgment. But black just wanted to open up the d file as quickly as possible. After queen takes, c takes d3. And now here, uh, white could have considered taking this pawn. Rook takes d3, king e1, rook a d8. Queen takes b7, rook c3. And there are really no targets for the white queen. And white has some problems still. He has these pieces, and it's not clear how the white, uh, how white will you know, unravel his king side. So is, it probably slightly favors black. I mean, the, the, the material situation is rook and bishop for queen. But neither side, I mean, black has, uh, the white king is the target. But outside of that, there are no obvious targets for, uh, for uh, black. Long except maybe the a2 pawn. Hmm. So instead, white played knight h3, trying to solve his developing problems. And then by, whoops, by uh, you know getting a knight to uh, take back on d3. But here, uh, this uh, this would have allowed a very strong d takes c2. And after king takes c2, bishop takes a2, and this uh, pawn cannot be taken because of uh, knight to b4 check. 
And with the, uh, with the two rooks back here and the two passed pawns, you would think that this would have to favor black. Else the uh, white king just has no protection whatsoever. However, um, black made a tremendous error in this position. When the, whenever you have a pawn that's so far down the board that you've invested so much time in obtaining, it's uh, is tempting to try and keep it on the board as long as possible. But d2, you know, blocks up the center, stops, uh, it really slows down black's attack against white's king. So, is uh, even though the white king is stuck on d1 for some time, I, I cannot recommend this move. It was, it was far more important for uh, black to open lines and, you know, take, take a defender, this pawn on c2, away from white's king. So, uh, knight f4 was played, and then bishop c4, stopping the, you know, the knight from going to d3. So, queen c3, and uh, now black decided to take this pawn on a2. And now knight d3, so this pawn has been surrounded now. And rook a c8. Well, getting a rook on the same file as your opponent's queen is uh, seldom a bad idea. And, again, uh, black correctly recognizes that you know, d3 is the square that we want to attack, and in order to attack that, we need to attack c2. If you remove c2, you remove the support of uh, d3, the prior uh, procedure usually known as undermining. But knight d4 directly attacking the, uh, the pawn on c2 was better. The game might have gone queen b2, bishop c4, you know, threatening to remove the pawn on c2 and then remove the knight on d3. So king takes, knight takes, king takes, bishop takes, check, king b3. Uh, this position is definitely better for uh, black, and it's better with the, uh, it's better to have the rook and bishop on the board uh, together as opposed to the knight and rook, as we'll see later in the game. So, rook ac8, Again, too slow. Queen a3. And here, again, we get the theme of uh, black playing on white's back rank. Bishop b1. A, a good move, actually. Very strange place to hide a bishop, but it threatens to uh, take on c2. So king takes d2, bishop takes c2, knight uh, king takes, and now knight to uh, b4 double check. And also d3 is falling. But the knight, uh, I mean, the knight is nice to have on d3, but it would have been better to have a bishop there. Uh, knight takes d3, rook d1, pinning. And here, I mean, a bishop could just, like, go back to, well, a bishop would be giving checks, so it's not, I mean, different moves would have been played to get to this position. Um, but still, there's a problem with the knight, you know, being threatened twice on d3. Black uh, did not find the best move here. He played knight e5, simply removing the knight from harm and preparing to go back to c6, which is a pretty good square for the knight. You know, guards d8, guards e7, is supported by the pawn on b7. But the better move would have been rook d6, preparing to, you know, bring the rooks doubly into the d file and supporting the knight on d3. It looks like white can take on d3, but then rook b6 check. King a1, rook a6 is clearly not an option. So, rook b3 instead. Now here, black has a gorgeous cross pin with rook to c3. However, this position, uh, this position should go to a drawn rook and pawn endgame. After rook takes b6, rook takes a3, rook takes b7, king f8. Again, we have a rook and pawn endgame with an extra rook pawn for black. White would still have to white would still have to prove himself in this endgame, but uh, my uh, my experience is that this should be a draw because white white has a pretty good defensive position. But still, it would have been better to uh, it would have been better to play for a draw that way than to try and well see what happened in the game. Uh, knight e5 was played. 
Rook takes d8, rook takes d8, queen takes e7, knight c6, uh, queen f6. This is, uh, under this position, probably should be a draw, but it's very, both sides have a lot of play here. And in fact, a lot of mistakes were made. But uh, from this moment on, Black never really has any winning chances, despite the fact that he's got you know, these two past pawns and uh, White's king is sitting back here. I mean, White's plan is pretty obvious. He's got the, uh, the four pawns against three pawns and the queen very aggressively situated on f6. So White is going to try to advance his pawns and puncture some holes in the uh, black pawn structure. You know, to try to attack Black's king. And Black, I don't know, if you can, uh, if you can imagine a world without countries or religions, then you can imagine, say, a black pawn on a3, a black knight on b4, and a black rook on, uh, you know, delivering checkmate on d1. But, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a race to, uh, it's kind of a race to get this far, because white, I mean, black is going to have to advance his uh, pawns, white is going to have to advance his pawns, and there's going to be some threats of checkmate on both sides. So, uh, rook d2, uh, this is a dual purpose move that confines the white king to the back rank, and also, you know, prepares to uh, harass the white pawns from behind. So it's, a, it's an aggressive and defensive move, rook d2. This move would have been preferable to uh, a5 as played in the game. Of course, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to uh, calculate because you have to keep in mind you know, possibilities for, uh, you know, for, you know, for both sides like continually advancing their pawns. You know, it's happened in the game. Uh, h4, and here, Black played a4 but should not have is more important to play h5. So this, uh, this gives black a better chance of defending against uh, white's king side. After g4, h takes g4, f takes g4, rook e8. I like the chances for a black because he can use the e6 as well as the e5 square for his pieces. Um, Let's see, h5 was not played, though. Instead, a4 was played. I mean, uh, Black probably is trying for the plan that I just discussed of, you know, creating the mating net around White's king. But he, is, uh, he allows h5. And h5 threatens to play h6 and, you know, checkmate Black on uh, g7. So if g takes h5, queen g5 check, King f8, king a2, is, uh, this probably favors white because these pawns are, uh, they're very loose. White's king is, uh, white's king is safer here than it would be on b1 with the rook coming to d2. Black has to be concerned about, uh, you know, white trying to take this pawn on a4 in some lines. And also, white can advance the f pawn. If the f pawn gets up to f6, you know, there might be some problems due to uh, threats of uh, queen g7, queen g8, queen takes f7. So, yeah, uh, actually, White played g4, which is not not efficient. He should have played uh, h5 right away. So a3 was played by Black, and then h5 by White. And here, Black may have made the losing mistake. Uh, he has more chances if he plays rook to d1 check. Rook to d1 check, uh, well, it's in the game, Black played the rook to d2. But in this position, there's no time for that. Here, uh, if king a2, this is a draw because of rook to d3. Now, this defends black's pawn, but more importantly, threatens mate in two with knight b4 check, and king goes back and rook d1 mate. So the fantasy mate that I talked about earlier is now in the position. 
how does uh, how does White stop the knight from going to b4? Well, he can't play queen e7. He can't play queen d4. And he can't play queen c3. Queen d6 is also out of the question, and there's no check. So black is threatening maiden two. Um, pretty much the only thing White can do is king to b1. And now knight b4. So all uh, all these squares are now covered, and rook d1 main is threatened. And uh, Dwight, uh, White is just too slow. There's no there's no checks he can throw. He can't threaten maiden one because Black is already threatening maiden one. So king c1, and now knight a2 check, king c2, knight b4 check, protecting the rook and also giving check. So king c1, knight a2 check, king b1, knight b4, and White would have to agree to draw. Is a sort of a perpetual check, perpetual mate threat kind of deal. So uh, rook d1, see what if what if king c2 was played? Well, rook to f1, threatening the pawn on f3 should the white queen move. And uh, also, I mean, if, if h6 is played here, threatening mate, black plays king f8, you know, so that if the check is not mate, he can get out. And in fact, if queen to g7 check, king e7, I mean, there are no, you know, there are no checks for, uh, for white. And if he tries to grab this pawn and queen the h pawn, well, Black's a pawn is much more dangerous than uh, White's h pawn because White is uh, Black is supporting this with his rook already. So uh, instead of Queen g7 check, which might lead uh, to trouble for White, Queen d6 check picking up this pawn is probably necessary. And after King e8, Queen takes uh, Knight d4 check. And this is, uh, this is going to be another perpetual check draw. So, see, why is this a draw? Well, the, uh, the white king can't, cannot go to c2, can't go to b3 or e2, because the knight covers those squares. The king can't go to a3 because the queen is on that square. If the white king at any time goes to c3, d3, or e3, then there's rook takes f3 check and then uh, take the queen. So those squares are out as well. Also, if at any point the king goes to e1, then there will be a knight to c2 check, forking the king and queen. So e1 cannot be visited as well. So it's just these, se these seven squares, basically, in the corner that the white king is confined to. So after white's king moves to one of these seven squares, um, the, rook is just going to, the rook is going to give check repeatedly on uh, f1 and f2. So this is another perpetual check draw. And so that, uh, that was uh, possible after rook d1 check, but that was not played in the game, rook d2. And I believe that was this, this might have been the decisive error, because after rook d2, there's h6, threatening mate on uh, g7. And the best defense is for, uh, again, for black to move out of it with king f8, queen check, king e7, queen c3. And this, uh, this is kind of a forced sequence. Um, you know, it's threatening a3 and d2. So a2 check, king a1, rook g2, you know, safe from, uh, we want to be safe from just, you know, checks picking up our rook. So g2 is the best square. And now c5, queen c5 check. And uh, this position, you know, whether, it doesn't really matter where uh, black plays his king, is, uh, the situation is that Black's uh, counterplay is if White moves the Queen away from b4, he'll play Knight b4, protecting the pawn, and then Rook to g1 check. But White doesn't have to allow that. He has a lot of resources, especially because Black's king has been flushed out of the castle. He's now exposed to checks. So in a lot of lines, White doesn't even have to cover b4 constantly as long as he can, you know, get back to the dark squares with check. So king e8, there's queen b5 leading to advantage after, say, king f8, f4. 
And if the king goes to the queen side with king d7, there's also queen b5, king c7, g5. And uh, this white is, uh, you know, white is better in this end game, but it would have been interesting to see played out. Instead, after h6, black uh, blundered and played a2 check. And king c1 was played by white. And now there's mate threatened and also the rook threatened. Black resigned in this position. However, uh, he could have prolonged the game by sacrificing his passed pawn. With uh, a1 check, this did not happen, by the way. a1 check, uh, queen takes a1, rook d4, stopping checkmate and also protecting the rook. But after queen b2, it is uh, is almost certain that white is going to win this game. There's uh, the pawn on b7 is falling, and uh, in addition, there's uh, you know a liability on g7. There's just very weak back rank problems for black in general. So uh, yeah, uh, this this line with uh, with king f8 definitely would have been the most uh, entertaining continuation to an already fan to an already uh, you know fantastic struggle. I mean, there were a lot of mistakes on both sides, but uh, I thought the tactical themes present throughout were very interesting. You know, with the, with the black pieces playing on white's back rank earlier, and then the, uh, you know, the sort of endgame race between the uh, between black's queen side attack and white's king side attack. Anyway, um, I hope that you enjoyed uh, this examination of uh, Kepke versus Wheat. 1995, and I will uh, I will see you in the future. Good luck with your chess.